Hey, this is The Other Map, and this video is about history and video games. This isn't the history of video games, which you can definitely find elsewhere, but I don't know much about that anyway, except that Nintendo probably began by manufacturing playing cards for the Yakuza. I'll link to a video on that in the description. No, this is about video games with historical settings, and the potential of games to preserve the past in digital form. For example, would you rather look at black and white pictures of prohibition gangsters or learn about the era by running an illegal booze empire yourself in full color? Would you rather watch videos about skateboarding during the California drought of the 1970s or hop backyard fences digitally to skate pools yourself? What about walking around simulations of ancient cities like All Andalus or Cahokia? I think we can all agree that a digital medieval Venice would be crazy cool. There's a lot of potential for video games as historical education, potential which has only sort of been exploited. The Oregon Trail was great, but it didn't really put you there there. Although with events like the Donner Party not being there is probably for the best. We'll get into some good examples and yes, talk about Assassin's Creed, but before that we need to talk about the difference between history and historical fiction. First, there's a major disclaimer here, I'm not a gamer. I just never got into it outside of a few titles. Because of this, odds are I'll get some things wrong about the gaming experience, but oh well. So what is historical fiction? On one side of the spectrum we have a movie like 2007's The Counterfeiters, which I highly recommend. This film follows the life story of Jewish World War II survivor Adolf Berger, who counterfeited money for the Germans in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp in order to survive. The story is an important and underexposed one, and the main character is certainly flawed, and there is even the possibility of the events taking place in the film turning the tide of the entire war. A class act, in my opinion, and a work with a lot to teach viewers. On the other side, we have the Owen Wilson, Jackie Chan buddy comedy Shanghai Noon from the year 2000. In Shanghai Noon, set in 1881, a Chinese princess is kidnapped and taken to the United States, where an Imperial Guardsman from Beijing, with help from a train-robbing gunslinger, ends up saving and marrying her in Nevada. Gunslinger turns out to be Wyatt Earp, and he and the guard finish the film by becoming sheriffs and riding off to chase criminals. Shanghai Noon is based on stereotypes of the Wild West and Kung Fu genres, both of which are sort of based in historical fact, but are you going to learn anything about history by watching it? Definitely not. For example, Wyatt Earp never mentioned digging himself out of neck high dirt using chopsticks. Basically, Shanghai Noon is fiction with a little bit of history, and The Counterfeiters is, supposedly, actual history packaged into a digestible fictional narrative. I bring Shanghai Noon up to talk about Red Dead Redemption 2, which again is based on Wild West stereotypes. Yes, the Pinkertons were real, and you might learn something about life in the 1800s by playing the game. But is it meant to be historically accurate? Absolutely not. The locations aren't even real. However, there are some games that have enough historically accurate content to be considered at least somewhat educational, and that's where things get interesting. This video was inspired by a comment left on a video I did about Hong Kong that referenced the 2012 video game Sleeping Dogs. Originally, Sleeping Dogs was in production under the title True Crime Hong Kong, a game that would have included a large percentage of the actual city as a map. But when it came out, the Sleeping Dogs version of Hong Kong was significantly smaller than the city it mimicked. However, as far as providing an urban environment that resembled actual neighborhoods on Hong Kong Island, the game was praised for its relative accuracy. Although the four neighborhoods were more sparsely populated and smaller than their real-life counterparts, and obviously digital, even if the graphics were state-of-the-art at the time, it's still cool that you can buy a now-cheap game on Steam and get a solid dose of Hong Kong, versus having to go on a much, much more expensive and almost certainly less entertaining trip to the actual city. But Hong Kong itself was still around for reference in 2012 making the job of the Sleeping Dogs developers, United Front Games, more one of copying than reconstructing. This also applies to the Watch Dogs games, whose versions of Chicago, San Francisco, and London were so accurate that players familiar with those cities could use real-life shortcuts to get around in the game environments. The Watch Dog games were otherwise not very realistic, but mimicking real-life cities was pretty cool of them, so kudos to Ubisoft for that. 
At this point, there have been a ton of games that attempt historical settings, to various levels of accuracy and success. Too many to go into here. Because of that, I encourage people to comment about additional historical fiction games in the comments section. One project I'm having to bump for time is L.A. Noir, whose developers put a lot of historical details into the environment and plot. Although L.A. Noir is more an homage to the film noir genre than a history of Los Angeles, the fact that you can see L.A.'s once ubiquitous red streetcars in a video game is pretty damn cool. However, the follow-up to L.A. Noir is well worth discussing, or the follow-up that might have been. Before allegations of bad business practices took down Team Bondi, the game studio behind L.A. Noir, the company was developing a game set in Old Shanghai, or the period in history of the Chinese city of Shanghai that saw it under the shadow of European colonialism. There's still some test footage floating around from the game, which we'll link to in the description, and the game's working title was Horror of the Orient, an actual nickname of Old Shanghai's. Let me put it this way, reconstructing a city that only exists in photographs, a few rescued movies, and written sources is exactly what I'm talking about as far as historical preservation. As I said, there were downsides to Team Bondi's business practices, chiefly the programmers were overworked to an extreme degree, but I would have loved to have been able to walk around a reconstructed version of Shanghai in the 1930s. For one thing, interpretations of this crazy part of world history are rare, and for another, if L.A. Noir is any indication, historical accuracy wouldn't have just been an afterthought for the developers. Of course, Horror of the Orient might have just been trash. It had already stirred up controversy with its title alone, but it had a lot of promise. Oh well, here's hoping we get Old Shanghai and other lost cities as games in the future. Of course, the most popular and arguably most important history-based video game franchise in existence is the Assassin's Creed series, a wildly popular franchise that consists of many works in multiple mediums. I hesitate to call Assassin's Creed historical, but it does mine history for its characters, setting, and plot points. I don't loathe this series as much as some actual historians do, but it has issues and brings up some important points as far as what creators owe consumers as far as accuracy in historical entertainment. For example, in broad terms, yes, the Order of Assassins, the protagonist of the franchise, really existed. According to Wikipedia, the Islamic Nazari state in the Persian region of Alamut, between roughly the years 1090 and 1290 AD, employed a force known as the Fidai, an order of extremely capable killers and spies whose often suicidal missions were the source of the legend of the Assassins. However, the Order of Assassins in Assassin's Creed has more in common with later European accounts of this Persian group, such as Marco Polo's, than historical fact, and the franchise is far from alone in basing characters on the Fidai. In fact, the Order has basically been strip-mined for entertainment purposes since the days in which it existed, usually as a group of villains. There's even another famous modern co-option of this Crusades-era crew of killers. The Fadai are also the basis for the League of Assassins in the Batman franchise, an organization run by the immortal character Ra's al Ghul, whose daughter Talia canonically had a kid with Batman. The League of Assassins even served as the overarching villains in Christopher Nolan's trilogy of Batman films. Needless to say, Lazarus Pits and Animus devices were not actually part of the Fadai story. But in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with historical fiction, even if the history of use has been done to death before. Where things get a little sketchy is that Assassin's Creed games cover a lot of ground and are, in a lot of cases, so popular that they're the only exposure to actual history casual consumers of media get. And when you're basically supplying a massive amount of people with their first and potentially sole exposure to a piece of history, but it's not actually real history, that's kind of messed up. To illustrate the issues this brings up, we can look at some 2012 bonus content for the major release Assassin's Creed Black Flag. This is a smaller game called Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry. This downloadable content is set in Saint-Domingue, or the French territory that was Haiti before that nation was born in a revolution. I consider the Haitian Revolution to be one of the heaviest conflicts ever, so I was happy to find out the gamers got a look at that era. After all, what's more epic than slaves rising up and toppling the rule of a major global power and forming an independent state? As I said in the intro, I'm not a gamer myself, but I was stoked to learn that this title exists. 
But that stoke was dampened when I read into the game a little and watched a walkthrough. It's not set during the revolution. In fact, the specific Maroon Rebel movement in the game, which hypothetically took place between 1735 and 1737, isn't in the historical record, or at least not one I could access. It probably didn't happen. By setting it when they did, they skipped over both the very real and successful Haitian Revolution, which took place from 1791 to 1804, and the true-to-life historical figure of Francois Macandal, a one-armed, Arabic-speaking, Vodon priest poison expert that led an attempted revolution before his death in 1758. Although, to be fair, it looks like that man is referenced in another Assassin's Creed game, and his story has been told multiple times elsewhere. But there are also things that are just incorrect. According to the game, in 1735, the capital of Saint-Domingue was Port-au-Prince, a city in the middle of the colony's territory. In reality, in 1735, the capital was the city of Cap Francais, a city on the far northeast coast of the country. It would remain the capital until 1770. A real-life French scientist named Louis Godin is present in Port-au-Prince in the game, but he was actually stationed in a neighboring country. Godin was actually interested in the shape of the Earth, which is part of the game's plot, but the rest of that plot line, that is, navigational research would have resulted in a discovery that would have altered the course of Caribbean seafaring, that's kind of laughable. The game doesn't seem poorly done, although freeing plantations as a video game mechanic is kind of strange. The sequence of the main character escaping a sinking slave ship is, frankly, powerful, and I can't think of a story that deserves more common knowledge than that of the Maroons which were real communities of escaped slaves that actually did raid plantations and lived in hideouts and as nomads, often alongside native peoples across the Caribbean. But as far as a lesson in Haitian history, why that period? Why those people? Why the inaccurate geography? Is it good that people are exposed to the information in Freedom Cry? I think so. But if you only played the game and didn't do any research yourself, you would walk away with a somewhat warped view of the past. Augustin Dufault was not a Haitian hero, he's a fictional character, and yet his story interacts with real characters in Freedom Cry, and people that have played the game know who he is. Francois Macandal, Toussaint L'Ouverture, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines are true heroes of the Haitian resistance and revolution, but they're not in the game, and Assassin's Creed players know less about them than the non-existent Dufault. All this may not seem bad, but Freedom Cry is short, really short. Most of the Assassin's Creed games are a lot longer, the plots are more complex, and the information exponentially more inaccurate. Regardless of your take on Assassin's Creed's historical aspects, it's safe to say that if Ubisoft, the publisher, put more effort into accuracy, this franchise could be a perfect example of the power of video games as far as preserving historical eras in an interactive way, even if you're still running around on rooftops killing people. And the fact is that no one gets historical fiction 100% right anyway, so the problems real historians have with the series may be the same problems they'd have with any historical media. Now there's an obvious way to solve this and other problems, however. Historians themselves need to get into the business of making games. If we had an accurate, interactive version of, say, pre-revolutionary Cuba, I mean, that'd be a better way to learn about it than T.J. English's Havana Nocturne. And I recommend that book every chance I get, link in the description. Bottom line, video games as a medium have a lot of untapped potential for accurate representation of history. So let's make it happen. How we don't already have a living, breathing model of ancient Rome is just beyond me. This has been another map video. You know where the buttons are and check the comments section in the description for corrections and additional info. Peace out.